And they're like, guess what, bitches? It also kills people who are around people smoking the product. Oh, for f**k's sake! This video is brought to you by British American Tobacco. It's not really, it's brought to you by Squarespace. I don't think I'd accept a sponsorship from a tobacco company. Generally, people are like, Simon, you'll literally advertise anything. And I always point out, yo, 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 have you ever heard of Rage Shadow Legends advertised on this channel? The answer is no, because I don't advertise things that I don't like or things that try to take money from you with micropayments that, I mean, sometimes that's okay. Most of the times it's not, because it's exploitative. But let's start this video with some companies that are bigger pieces of sh I am. Allegedly. Philip Morris. <laughs> yeah, definitely allegedly, in my opinion. Uh, and probably the opinion of many, many theoretical people. Philip Morris International, CEO, 2011. Quote, whilst tobacco is addictive, it's not that hard to quit. My dude, you said that 10 years ago? 10 years ago is not a long time in the grand scheme of smoking tobacco, is it? Yeah, well... You know, that's just like, uh, your opinion, man. Imperial Tobacco, internal report, 1990s. Oh, I love a leaked internal report. That's always gonna be juicy. The desire to quit seems to come earlier now than before. Attempts to quit are very painful. They thought that they could quit easily, but they soon learn that they have become slaves to their cigarettes. Whenever your product is making someone a slave, in whatever context, not a good thing, Imperial Tobacco. Dr. L. Blackman, Director of Research and Development of British American Tobacco in 1981. Please don't tell me he's a real doctor. Please just tell me he's like doctor of guitar or something. I'm a doctor. Despite a never-ending stream of research on the possible health hazards of smoking, there is no proof of a cause and effect relationship between cigarette smoking and various alleged smoking diseases. Ah, 1981, my dude. That was 40 years ago. I'm pretty sure, like, look, in Mad Men, they're like, that, which is in the 1960s, early 1960s, they're like, pretty sure this smoking thing is not good for people. 20 years later, bro, we know that it's given people all sorts of tumors. R. Berryman, Tobacco Institute, Australia, 1989. So are potatoes. Cancer causing, that is. Tobacco is in the same family. You inhale the fumes of potatoes when you're cooking them. <laughs> No, you don't. What are you talking about? <laughs> These people, it's amazing. R.J. Reynolds, tobacco company chairman, 1996. If children don't like to be in a smoky room, they'll leave. At some point, they begin to crawl. Yeah. Oh, my God. Philip Morris memo, 1981. Oh, good, another internal one. We do realize that today's teenager is tomorrow's potential regular customer. That actually seems very mild, Philip Morris. I'd be su more surprised the internal, rem internal memo doesn't read. If we get kids hooked when they're young, they will continue to smoke forever until they die early, but then we'll sell to their children. <laughs> Let cigarettes remind you of dad <laughs> and his painful death by cancer. Philip Morris, president, 1971. It's true that babies born from women who smoke are smaller, but they're just as healthy as the baby born, born, babies born to women who do not smoke. Some women would prefer to have smaller babies. Am I right, Peter? Oh my God, could you be more, like, <laughs> willfully oblivious? R.J. Reynolds Executive, 1992. We don't smoke that sh We just sell it. We reserve the right to smoke for the young, the poor, the black, and the stupid. They're stupid to us. Quorum he, Vitio Morianis. Morianis? Oh my God, does R.J. Reynolds exist anymore <laughs> as a tobacco? I've never heard of it. But then it'll probably be like, yeah, 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 they own like Rothmans or something, just some giant company. Philip Morris, CEO, 1998. What do you think smokers would do if they didn't smoke? You get pleasure from it. And you get some other beneficial things, such as relief. <laughs> Maybe you'd beat your wife. Dude, is the CEO in 1998? This in 1998, the CEO of Philip Morris is essentially saying, "Yo, smoking stops people from beating their wives. If people didn't smoke, they'd all beat their wives." I don't smoke. Also, don't beat my wife. Things are doing. It seems like I'm doing okay, Philip. I'm bucking the trend, aren't I, Philip? Am I right, Philip? Is going to be the, the the one we use in today's episode because. It just is. And is in no way in relation to Philip Morris, the giant tobacco company that just happens to also be called Philip Morris. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing to do with the fact that we're now, you know, using that as our absolute tobacco company trolling shout out. 
In a stunning turn of events, a superhero is being sued. Well, thank goodness we discovered tobacco. Oh, this isn't a quote. We're actually getting started with the script. I'm sure we're about to get into Danny's lengthy introduction after the quote introduction, which is a brand new thing. Welcome to Blaine Blaine, blah, blah, blah. Brain Blaze. It's Brain Blaze. Even though it's now all about business. What is going on? So that was a fucking lie. Well, thank goodness we discovered tobacco. It sounds as if we'd all have regressed into savage animals without the calming influence of cancer. Ah, yes, nothing like cancer to settle my nerves. It's got to be a tricky job working as an executive for a multi-billion dollar com tobacco company and attempting to put a positive spin on the stark truth that you're killing off seven million of your customers every year. It's little wonder that the public statements often bear little relation to the internal memos. Ah, oh, come on, Danny. Ah, look, Toyota could say the same thing. There are people who die in car accidents every year. Ah, their executives don't lose any sleep over that, do they? Am I right, Philip? Except they do. And then they make the cars as safe as possible. As super safe as possible. And Philip Morris, I mean, I mean, generic large tobacco company, <laughs> not Philip Morris, they, uh, they, they make lights, which also kill you. Allegedly. The tobacco industry has felt na has naturally felt a pressing need to lie to us, spread disinformation, and blindly dispute any scientific evidence which might indicate that their products are toxic. Who would have thought that? They've been doing this now for longer than the average life expectancy of a moderate smoker. <laughs> well, they've been doing it for 26 years, Danny. Ah, uh, am I right, Philip? And along the way, they've resorted to tactics which are dirtier than the overflowing ashtrays of 1970s working men's club in the north of England. Yes. I think I've told this story before, but I, went, I once went to the north of England, and it was a really, like, they speak really differently up there. And I was coming out, like, I went to visit my friend at university. We went out, like, to the nightclubs and stuff. We had a, we had a banger. And then we're walking home, and some guy comes up to me on the street. He's drunk. I mean, so am I. And he's like, oh, lash us a fag, mate. And I'm like, well, I know what a fag is. You what? Oh, Americans, it's a cigarette in British. <laughs> this video is going to get demonetized, isn't it? Hate speech. No, it's a cigarette. Calm down. How dare you? And he's like, I'm like, but I have no idea what lash us means. And my friend, who's also from the South, who was at a university in Newcastle, he's like, it means, can you give him a cigarette? And I'm like, oh my God, not only do I not know what he's saying, but I can't give him what he wants. Please don't stab me. I've heard this is how it is in the North. The king of the North. The king of the North. The Lannisters and it was a 387-page report compiled by the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health in 1964, which per first provided concrete evidence of a link between smoking tobacco and lung cancer. Uh, but... I kind of wish in a way I lived before that time because, like, I don't smoke, but I find the smell of tobacco of, like, a good cigarette, like, not some nasty one, but, like, a good cigarette does smell very nice. And I'd be like, that looks extremely pleasurable. It's just a shame that it's killing me. But if I lived in, like, the 1930s, I'd be smoking it. I'd be making these videos smoking because I'm like, it's good for me and it's amazing. It's like chilies. Chilies are good for you, and also a garlic is another one. Garlic is good for you, and also amazing. I really think that at some point the fun is going to be spoiled, and people are going to be like, yeah, chilies and garlic cause cancer. I'll be like, I knew it. They were too good. And I think the same argument can be made for aspartame. There's absolutely zero scientific evidence that aspartame, the artificial sweetener, that runs like, oh, gives you cancer. It doesn't, you idiot. What are you, fucking stupid? <laughs> and like uh, saccharin and all of this stuff. They seem to be perfectly good for you. There's absolutely no scientific evidence that they cause cancer, but I'm a little bit nervous because I'm like, it's too good. It's too, wait, I can have that Coke. And it's, I mean, it's 90% there. For me, I know some people are like, oh, I can taste the aspartame, I can taste it, shut the f up. I can't, it's my opinion. Uh, it's 90% like there, but it doesn't have 37 grams of sugar per can. And I'm like, okay. This seems too good to be true, which is why I think it's going to kill me. What are we talking about? Ah oh, yes, cancer. But there's been several warning signs along the way which were big enough to adorn the front cover of a modern cigarette packet. So Walter Raleigh is credited with introducing tobacco to the court of Elizabeth I in 1586 after he got back from a trip to Virginia, although it's probable the tobacco had already been knocking around in Europe far earlier than this. An urban myth suggests that Walter introduced both tobacco and potatoes to the shores of England, but one of those new discoveries was met with immediate suspicion and disapproval. It was to potatoes. I made a whole video about this on the Today I Found Out channel. If you want to watch it after this one, you can. If you're finding this a bit too intense and it's like, why has Simon taken so much cocaine? Uh, then you can check out the Today I Found Out channel. It's much more sedate, uh, sensible. Yes. <laughs> it covers other topics. Succinctly. <laughs>
<laughs> it's a novelty, isn't it? Weirdly, though, tobacco was considered to be fine. It was the strange foreign potatoes that were deemed to be a bit dodgy. <laughs> ah, what could be wrong with lighting this on fire and breathing it into our lungs and feeling a nice uh, nicotine buzz? <laughs> Those disgusting cancer-causing potatoes. As early as 1604, King James I was describing the act of smoking as loathsome, as a loathsome custom of black and stinking fume, while the Chinese philosopher Fang Yizi was one of the first to suggest that smoking scorched the lungs. <laughs> No one believes that. And in 1610, Sir Francis Bacon noted that there might just be something slightly addictive about tobacco, as he was finding it a tough habit to break. <laughs> I feel like back in the past, though, people didn't really understand addiction because they were like, yeah, yeah, what's this? It's codeine. Is it addictive? No, 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 no. Oh, loads of people got addicted to it. What's this? It's morphine. What is it? It's a less addictive version of codeine. Woo! Oh, it's... oh no, no, no. It turns out to be more addictive. Then what's this? Oh, it's heroin. It's like a less addictive version of morphine. You can see where this goes. You can see how fentanyl... <laughs> Uh, I don't know if fentanyl is particularly addictive. Doesn't it just kill everyone? Don't do fentanyl. <laughs> this message brought to you by the Public Health Authority. But, 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 but it's not. Don't get any ideas, Public Health Authority. I'm not for sale. I won't spread your lies about smoking killing. But about 300 years later, it seems that nobody had really inhaled any of these early smoke signals. Ah, but a boom, boom. The turn of the 20th century saw the emergence of the big tobacco companies as the popularity of tobacco cigarettes of cigarettes soared. Uh, I don't think we need to specify that the tobacco cigarettes. Although I had a friend of a friend at, at school who I can't remember what the context was, but they referred to like a spliff or a joint as a weed cigarette, and I was like. What are you, fucking stupid? I mean, technically, yes. <laughs> A weed cigarette. <laughs> and the two world wars turned out to be big profit spinners from this increasingly powerful new industry as millions of soldiers returned home from the battle with an addiction to free cigarettes that they'd been liberally supplied with in their rations to help perk up a gloomy day. Look, if I was on the trenches of World War One, I'd be f***ing smoking. Absolutely no doubt in my mind. It'd be like, look, smoking seems really nice and I'm probably gonna die anyway. From a, in a horrible way while I've got double trench foot. Haven't I? But even though scientific evidence was still a few decades away, it can't have escaped everyone's attention that this smoking lark might not be quite as safe as the tobacco companies were insisting. Maybe it was the outbreak of an intense throat irritation or the fact that the simple morning routine of a smoker involved coughing up, coughing up your guts in the bathroom sink. Or maybe it was the alarming breathlessness and the grim realization that you could no longer wet, walk up. Uh, the mild incline to the cigarette shop without collapsing in a spluttering heap. Healthy though, no, nothing wrong with cigarettes. <laughs> Doctors recommend Lucky Stri- I mean generic, uh, generic cigarette company that is nameless. Uh, either way, the tobacco companies were quick to quash any concerns with a flurry of marketing updates throughout the 1930s and 40s, which indicated that it was the other rubbish brands which were giving you that tickly throat, and that's why you needed to switch. Yeah, but after like switching 20 times, you'd be like, oh my god, I've tried like 19 cigarettes. When am I going to find the right one? Maybe there isn't a right one, and you should start smoking uh, Lucky. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking, you should quit smoking. And if you're watching this, quit smoking. I mean, just give it a go. Try some nicotine gum or uh, a vape or uh, literally anything other than smoking. I mean, not like crack or something. Don't be like, I quit smoking and took up crack. Simon told me to. No, that's not what I meant. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit. In 1937, the Philip Morris Company took out an ad in the Saturday Evening Post, which made the bold claim that leading doctors had conducted a study with the intriguing outcome. When smokers changed Philip Morris, every case of irritation cleared up completely. This sounds like that time before advertising had to be true. <laughs> In the same decade, Lucky Strikes ran a campaign with, wow, I mean, literally just the company I was, I mean, allegedly spoke about, uh, which, I mean, it wasn't that. I meant, I meant when I said Lucky's, I meant the, uh, the, the Lucky Pony Company, famous for their cigarettes. <laughs> Lucky Pony, what's wrong with you, Whistler? Uh, which ran a campaign that revealed that the company's accounting firm had checked and certified the following statement of truth. 20,679 physicians say that Lucky's are less irritating to the throat. I don't know if I'd go to my accounting firm for that kind of study, I'd probably want to go to like a medical firm. Unless I'm misunderstanding what accounting is, but I'm fairly sure it's a basic concept. I'm a doctor. In the same decade, Lucky Strikes ran a campaign which revealed that the company's a Oh wait, I read that already. Ah, big brain. What are you, fucking stupid? <laughs> and later in 1946, the RJ Reynolds company, the humps behind the 
The humps? Oh, humps! Oh, cause it's a camel! ba da ba ba cha Launched a print campaign with a simple but compelling slogan. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. That can absolutely be true. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't... I mean, literally, that's a statement that says nothing. It's just like, yeah, yeah, doctors. But I, I, unless I'm wrong, like, in the 90s or 2000s, like, doctors smoked more than the average profession. And it's like, holy sh**, it must not be that bad then. Because, like, doctors see all the, the consequences of this and they're like, yeah, sounds, that sounds good to me. That sounds, it is weird, isn't it? Is, is, I guess, being a doctor stressful or something like that? I wouldn't know about stressful work. Um, all I do is make stupid videos on the internet. Ah, it's great though, isn't it? The idea was to make consumers feel that Philip Morris, Lucky Strike, and Camels must surely be kind to the throat of doctors and physicians. Uh, they were putting their weight, they were putting their weight behind them. And in the days before a clear link between smoking and cancer had been established, it's true that the vast majority of doctors and physicians were smokers. But were any of these claims entirely genuine. Yeah, my granddad was a doctor and a smoker. My, my, I only know this, I never met him because he died before I was born. <laughs> Probably because of his extremely healthy lifestyle. And uh, he smoked pipes. Like, my grandma just had a huge stack of his old pipes. And he was a doctor. I said, and he was in those that era where you'd go to the doctors and they'd like whip open a box of cigarettes and be like, cigarette? <laughs> can I do for you? And I'm like, oh my god, the past. Your doctor's giving you a cigarette. That's what I imagine my granddad did. <laughs> I mean, it was good for business, wasn't it? But what the adverts didn't reveal was that all those doctors who claimed the throat irritation cleared completely after switching to Philip Morris have been conducting research sponsored by none other than... Philip Morris, yes, you guessed it. And all 20,769 of those physicians who reckoned that Luckies were less irritating to the throat had been gifted a free carton of Lucky Strikes before they were asked a leading question on their opinion. Cigarettes weren't that expensive back in the day before they were like taxed the shite out of. So, I mean, that's very cheap. If you can buy a physician off for that price, it's quite amazing. I'd be like, yeah, business blaze, it's great for your heart. Say 20,000 physicians that I paid $5 to. Aren't physicians rich? What the fuck? Meanwhile, all those doctors who chose to light up a camel had been treated to a free carton of camels before they were asked to name their favorite brand. <laughs> Here's a giant packet of camels. We're from Camel. Are camels your favorite? Yes, they are. <laughs> I love camels. RJ Reynolds had gone several... Camels are one of those cigarettes that do smell nice. I feel like everybody in my family smoked, apparently, because I'm like, my aunt used to smoke camels. And uh, she lived in America, and I go out to visit. I remember her like smoking these camels out on the deck. I'd be like, it's a good smell. R.J. Reynolds had gone several steps further when they ran a wide-ranging campaign between 1936 and 1939, which suggested that Camel cigarettes weren't just the least poisonous brand. They were actually good for your digestion. The slogan for digestion's sake, Smoke Camels, became a regular sight on billboards across the U.S., while the print ads often went into more detail, revealing scientific studies show clearly the manner in which camels aid digestion, making smoking camels part of your daily life. And see how you'll make smoking camels part of your daily life and see how your digestion is measurably improved. Okay, okay. The FTC issued a cease and desist order to R.J. Reynolds in 1951, which prohibited the company from making such claims in the future on the grounds that R.J. Reynolds were talking out of their ass and the claim had no validity whatsoever. Honestly, 1951, I'm pretty surprised that that happened. Pretty impressed that there was an agency dealing with it. FTC, Food and Trade, Federal Trade Commission. Big brain, big brain. The FTC had left it a little late though, as the uh, campaign had been dropped 11 years earlier. Squarespace mid-roll. Oh, I see. It's time for a Squarespace ad, is it? <laughs> ah, yes it is. Don't you tap that skip ahead button. I see you. I mean, you could tap it ahead, but then go buy Squarespace. You don't don't even do it off the basis of my ad. It's probably not very good. Just go get some Squarespace. Set yourself up a website. Maybe you're going to launch a tobacco company. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's probably not the way of the future. Maybe you're launching some like tobacco alternative. Don't do that. That sounds so complicated. Learn if you're doing that, there's probably all sorts of regulations and stuff. So, I mean, just don't do that. Just don't do it! I don't think. It's pro I mean, maybe... Uh, look, okay, I'm not going to tell you what not to do. What am I talking about? Oh, yeah, Squarespace. Mm. Mwah. Squarespace. My heroes. Ah, the summer is coming to a close. It's September. The summer is already closed. Although it's really nice this week. It's like 30 degrees. Brilliant. What is this about? Ah, yes. So look, you're going to be inside. Winter's coming. Sit at the computer. Maybe you could... What's amazing about the computer? I, I love the internet. It's like the internet is how I make a living. You could just go on the internet and somehow like you do something and then money arrives in your bank account. I'm, I'm sure it's not that easy. 
It's just that, I don't know, it happened to work for me. But look, if you want to make that a possibility, if you want to think that's a thing that you could do, well, Squarespace allows it. I'm so off the talking points, but I think this is kind of like how I feel about this in general. Is that you got to try and you got to try and take a crack at something, whether that's a YouTube channel on YouTube or a blog or a website. Look, do something like that. Write things up. People come. Then there's you put adverts on it, and it makes you some money. Or start a shop. Yes, Squarespace also supports e-commerce. So if you like want to make a product, like some sort of tobacco, we already talked about not selling tobacco solutions. But look, I'm not a product genius. Like I don't, oh, although I do. I do have some products. But look, you've maybe got some idea for a business or whatever. Just pop onto Squarespace. It's very easy to get set up. You go in there and they have these templates, right? So you don't even really have to try. You just go in there. There's like a big page in them. You scroll through and you're like, well, that one's pretty. You click on it and then you go in. It's like you replace the images with your images. You replace the text with your text. You choose a new font and some colors. Bada bing, bada boom, bada bow. And you're done. You click publish and then it's like... Da -da -da -da. you got to choose like the, the thing. you got to pay Squarespace, obviously. It's isn't for free. Are you joking? But you can get it discounted. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And that's what you do. Also, Squarespace has other stuff that I probably have to... I've not even looked at this. I've not even looked at this. So I, I have to hit a few things. Email campaigns so you can tell people about your stuff or your blog or whatever. Patronage portals. Yes. So you can ask people for money if you're... I don't know. That could be a good one. Like if you're writing some super in-depth blog about something and you want to be like, yo, how about you like buy your boy a coffee every now and again? Boom! Patronage portal. Social integrations. I mean, kind of obviously Squarespace. Member only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24 seven customer support, everything you need in one place. Go to squarespace.com forward slash blaze. Uh, sometimes it's business blaze for other things, but it's blaze. Squarespace.com forward slash blaze. You'll get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Yeah, Squarespace, look, this rambled enough. Let's crack back on. By the 1950s, around half of the world's population were smokers. Yes! I mean, ah, oh, we shouldn't be cheering. Half? Oh my god, that is extraordinary. Although that figure is slightly skewed, as most smokers were still male in the UK al alone, no less than 80% of all men were happily puffing away on coffin nails. Can you imagine asking eight out of ten people if they smoke? And the answer being yes. Actually amazing. Yes! Yes! Today I'd be like, I don't really know it. I mean, I know one or two people who smoke, but it's very rare. Scientists had already began to speculate on the potential serious damage caused by smoking, but it was the Surgeon General's report which really put the camel amongst the pigeons when it concluded that smoking causes lung cancer, laryngeal cancer, chronic bronchitis, and slightly yellowed fingernails. Ah, don't worry, you're only going to get the last one. Ah, not really. And then the smoke got me. I got bronchitis. Uh, it pointed out that smokers were nine or ten times more likely to get lung cancer than an average non-smoker. This was a breathtaking oh my god here we go again i mean because it literally takes your breath because you breathe your last and die from cancer um allegedly conclusion which was changed the marketing landscape during this new period of enlightenment the tobacco industry wisely chose to drop those silly recommendations from doctors and the adverts which implied that smoking 40 snouts a day was good for you and they were snouts i don't know that term for a cigarette as they reckoned that nobody was buying that Anymore. I mean, the advertising, they were definitely still buying cigarettes because they were hopelessly addicted. Instead, during a period known as the Tar Derby, they now focused on filter tip technology and began to emphasize the lower tar content of that particular brand. It was a bit of a marketing tightrope as they were trying to push the advantages of filtered and low tar cigarettes without ever wishing to concede that smoking in general was bad for you. It'd be like someone putting an airbag in a car and being like, no, 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 it's cars are completely safe. This airbag is completely unnecessary. It's just going to explode in your face with a cushion of air just in an in an accident because i mean why not it's entertaining maybe with some confetti in there hey yeah yeah F tobacco man come on most of the advertisements delivered subtle statements about a cleaner smoke and reduced tar intake from filtered cigarettes but the duke brand was bolder than most when it came up with the persuasive 1960s slogan don't cut down on your smoking the big duke filter does it for you <laughs> Uh, the industry was well aware that it was all just a marketing smokescreen to lure their twitchier customers into smoking a safer cigarette. Are filtered cigarettes actually 
any safer? I thought they weren't. In truth, smokers inhale pretty much the same amounts of tar and nicotine from all these so-called low tar and ultralight brands. If anything, they were even more dangerous than regular cigarettes, partly because the ventilation holes you found on the filters usually encourage smokers to just take much deeper puffs, and partly because smokers felt less inclined to quit as they were convinced that these new safer cigarettes would pro would probably only kill them a teeny tiny bit. Yeah, but killed is still killed, isn't it, Danny? Isn't it smoking industry? But let's pause for a moment to think about the children. Surely even the tobacco industry wouldn't stoop so low as to try and entice young innocent minds into taking up the habit? Surely not! We'd never do that! Am I right, Philip? <coughs> And then the smoke got me. At one point, Bennett LeBeau, the CEO of the Liggett Tobacco Company, said, Well, as we pointed out earlier, the problem with selling a product that kills you is that you end up with a constantly diminishing customer base. As once pointed out by Bennett LeBeau, the CEO of the Liggett Tobacco Company, if you are really and truly not going to sell to children, you're going to go out of business in 30 years. Oh my god. <laughs> Please tell me that that was an internal private conversation that someone had bugged your office or something because you don't say that out loud. As Walker Merriman from the Tobacco Institute admitted in 1992 if it was legal to sell to him we'd be glad to but it's not you what i've said previously that companies aren't evil right it's you know they're corporations they're just profit driven and actually thinking about it i was gonna say like no i changed my mind i haven't changed my mind but walker you sound f***ing evil don't you mate <laughs> you sound like an evil twat alleged <laughs> Internal documents from R.J. Reynolds revealed the details of a 1974 presentation uh, which focused on how the youth market would evolve into regular customers of tomorrow and why the company should be targeting the interest demographic as young as 14. I've just realized something. I have to start a children's channel. They're the viewers of tomorrow! Stop it. Get some help. One cunning strategy for getting kids hooked was simply to hand them out free samples in the playground. The Laura Lad Tobacco Company regularly used to distribute free samples of Newport cigarettes from vans which drove around poorer inner city neighborhoods in the US in the 1950s and 60s. Oh, you should be f***ing shot. Mar Marie Evans alleged that one of the vans used to set up stall in the school playgrounds of Orchard Park neighborhood of Boston and hand out free samples to kids who were still only in single digits. I have no words. I'm without words. Fuck. Speak. Fuck. Good boy. Marie claims that she was only nine years old when she was given her first free sample of Newports and she received a regular supply of free cigarettes right through her teenage years. When Marie died from lung cancer in 2002 after four decades of smoking, her son sued Laura Lard on the grounds they had purposefully lured young children, specifically young black children, into taking up the habit. Laura Lard was happy to admit that the company regularly handed out free samples but always denied giving away free samples to children. After a long legal battle which dragged on for years and which at one point saw the jury recommend that Marie's son should be awarded $152 million in compensation from Laura Lars. Holy sh! The case was ultimately settled out of court with an agreement reported to be worth over, wait for it, $70 million. That is so much money that your children's children's children are gonna be rich because you won a settlement. I, I don't understand this. Like, this money, some of it should absolutely go to the sun. No question about it. A few million pounds, dollars. And the rest should go to like an anti-smoking charity because it's absurd. I mean, the 70 million isn't paid to the, the, the son because that's what they've determined that the mother's life was worth in his grief and suffering. It's like punitive damages to public punish the company. That punishment money shouldn't go to the person who was... They, right? Right? Another more subtle strategy for gripping the attention of the kids would be to rope in cartoon characters to help spread the word that smoking is cool. We've mentioned before on Brain Blaze how Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble were two early characters to endorse a cigarette brand on television. Winston Cigarettes sponsored the first few seasons of the Flintstones, and this meant that Fred and Barney would light up at the end of every episode and bang on about that smooth, filtered taste that you only get with the Winston. I've seen these adverts. Uh, they're, 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 they're as alarming as you expect, to be honest. But outside the realms of the idiot's lantern, other cartoony characters were being developed to slap on the packaging and take the role of the tobacco company mascot. A very early example of this was Willie the Penguin, who first appeared on the packaging of Cool Cigarettes in 1934. Cool already had a lot of things going in their flavor. Ah. I don't know if that's a bub bub or a typo. Uh, because they'd sold menthol cigarettes, I guess it's a bit of bub bub but a bum bum My bionic ass is giving me all sorts of trouble today. Think it's safely plugged in? 
Uh, menthol cigarettes were deemed to be less harmful than regular cigarettes because, well, they tasted a bit like menthol. <laughs> okay. Willie the Penguin made the clumsy waddle to TV commercials in the 1950s where he was often depicted in a different profession such as a doctor or a chief or a soldier. But he also made an even clumsier waddle into his own short-lived comic book series in 1951 targeted squarely at a juvenile audience. Admittedly, there was no reference to smoking within the comic strip adventures of Willie and his new mischievous animal pals and the comic book was pulled after only six issues. But it's still mildly disconcerting that a fresh-faced comic strip hero of 1951 was exactly the same penguin dude flogging six cigarettes on the TV. I can't believe this is legal even back then. The past was the worst. Willie was eventually dropped as the cool mascot in 1960, but it's possible that he inspired the creation of a comic strip penguin villain who was destined to enjoy a far longer spot in the limelight as an adversary of Batman. Although Batman co-creator Bill Finger maintains that the penguin was meant to be a caricature of aristocrats and was usually modeled on the Emperor Penguin, the more famous creator Bob Kane insists that the penguin was inspired entirely by a picture of Willie wearing a top hat and wearing an Umbrella. A more recent and possibly plausible divisive example of a cartoon mascot was a certain Joe Camel. The pop up regularly on Camel packaging and in marketing campaigns from the late 1980s. Yeah, I know Joe Camel. Like, I know what he looks like. And it's weird, because it's weird. You can't advertise. Cartoons are. I know people will be like, oh, Simon, uh, anime is for adults. Uh, there are cartoons for adults. Have you not heard of Family Guide? I'll be like, yes, but fundamentally, cartoons are, you know, for children, mostly. Basement or South Park, another great example. But they're mostly for kids. And then making a cartoon thing advertising cigarettes. It's just a little bit sketch, isn't it? Am I right, Philip? Am I right? Packets of the brands had always depicted a realistically drawn camel known as Old Joe since the cigarettes were first launched in 1913. The cartoon character of Old Joe was first developed for a small French advertising campaign in the 1970s, and the idea was dug up and resurrected as a much, on a much bigger scale in 1987, when the brand was preparing to celebrate its imminent 75th anniversary with the global, introdu global introduction of Joe Camel. Unlike the original boring Old Joe, the idea behind the funkier Joe Camel is that it'd look cool and hip and colorful and be engaging in print media and on bills boards especially <laughs> he didn't really look much like a typical camel for starters he didn't have four legs or a hump or a tail he was more just a humanoid version of a camel with a cocky grin and a giant nose jet setting joe would often be depicted wearing leather jackets and ray bands as we saw him taking a racing car for a spin shooting a mean game of pool or inventing inviting lucky ladies to joining him in his join him in his hot tub oh my he was the kind of camel that every young kid aspired to be when he grew up yeah yeah it does sound pretty cool doesn't he <laughs> Smokey and leather jays, like some James Dean mother. Smokers of the brands were encouraged to collect camel cash in the form of promotional tokens stuck to the back of packets and exchange this currency for a range of items from the Camel Cash catalog. These included Joe Camel branded baseball caps, t shirts, watches, sunglasses, lighters, and let denim jackets. Oh my god. So bad. The accusation leveled at R.J. Reynolds is that the cartoon character of Joe Camel and all his associated merchandise were targeted at a young audience and that the camel was the face of everything that was wrong with the underhanded tobacco industry. Some of the figures do appear to back this up. Before the introduction of the decade-long campaign, teenage smokers accounted for $6 million worth of camel sales, while by the 1990s this figure had mushroomed to $476 million. Oh my god. <laughs> so... It's unquestionable that your cartoon advertising campaign of Joe Camel succeeded in massively increasing the number of people, teenagers, kids, smoking your cigarettes, allegedly. Hello, I like money. Money! Nearly 33% of all cigarettes sold to minors or camels, so this was clearly the brand of choice for the young smoker just out of nappies. That is incredible, Camel. You absolute piece of sh in my opinion. To add butane to the flames, the Journal of the American Medical Association published the results of a 1991 study conducted by Dr. Paul Fisher, in which 229 kids were shown a picture of Joe Camel. Despite the fact that he wasn't smoking in the picture, 91% of six-year-olds correctly identified that he was associated with cigarettes. In much the same way, they associated the Disney logo with Mickey Mouse, a photograph of Simon Whistler with Ray. Fuck you, Danny. <laughs> I mentioned at the start, I've never sp been sponsored by Ray Shadow Legends. Despite turning down some absolutely extraordinary figures, I mean money figures, like I've turned down an extraordinary amount of money not working with Raid. 
However, a point that rarely gets remembered is that Dr. when Dr. Fisher was later forced to hand over his notes in court following a legal battle with R.J. Reynolds, it was also revealed that 96% of those same children claimed to disapprove of smoking. In their defense, R.J. Reynolds always maintained that Joe Campbell was targeted at the male aged 25 to 49. Yes, 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 I'm in that demographic, and everything I want to see advertised would be by a giant anthropomorphized cartoon camel who wears a leather jacket. No. And over the next 10 years, they resisted pressure to kill him off. And some of Joe's biggest fans have argued that just because he happens to be a cartoon camel, this shouldn't necessarily imply that he was designed for children, except, except, it's, it, uh, 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 uh. Following a lengthy lawsuit from a San Francisco attorney which accused R.J. Reynolds of promoting cigarettes uh, to children, the company eventually agreed to settle out of court in 1997. They paid $10 million to San Francisco and other California cities. Drop in the bucket, guys. Money that was spent on funding anti-smoking campaigns aimed at youths and dropped Joe Camel for good. Good. Uh, just one year later, well done. You did something morally correct after being legally forced to do it. <laughs> Dicks. In a stunning turn of events, a superhero is being sued. Just one year later, the use of cartoon characters were completely banned from tobacco marketing. President Clinton was happy to see the back of Joe and his kind. He declared, We must put tobacco ads like Joe Camel out of our children's reach forever. I remember Clinton being president, and it's alarming that this sh is going on then. Crazy. And the New York Times ran a touching tribute in an article which ran with the headline, Joe Camel, a giant in tobacco marketing, is dead at 23. I wonder what he died of. Poor old Joe Camel never had an opportunity to appear in TV commercials as the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act had already banned tobacco advertisements from TV and radio by 1971. Poor old Joe! Ah! Am I right, Philip? This posed a prickly problem for the plotting purveyors of profitable protracted pain which was patched up by a prosperous prescription of pernicious product placement. That was the first f***ing time. Legends. Mmm! Mmm! Self proclaimed. This posed a prickly problem for the plotting pervert. Oh, I read that already, didn't I? Ah, what's wrong with you? And it was very memorable. What are you fucking stupid? <laughs> The tobacco companies would never have openly admitted to paying for product placement in the movies, and they still denied, despite the availability of a big stack of internal documents and memos that appear to tell a very different story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the money's got the. <laughs> Someone's gonna be like, there's money going to, like, I don't know, XYZ Film Studio. And also, I do think one of the most successful ways of selling cigarettes, surely, is there's a movie, and the cool guy in the movie, the guy who's the hero, is smoking. And I'm like, how is this allowed? If anything would ever sell me a cigarette, it'd be like, you know, young Simon who doesn't know where he's going in life. And he's like, oh, you know, he's, you know, he's looking for people to be like, oh, I want to be like that. You know, you've got to have your idols and stuff. And if the guy in the movie who's a legend is smoking, you'd be like, I bet that's why he's so cool. It's because he's smoking. Let us begin smoking immediately. Internal audit suggests that Brown and William Tobacco Corp allegedly spent just shy of a million dollars on getting their brand on screen in 20 different movies during the late 70s and early 80s, including Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Rambo, and Rocky IV. Stars like Sylvester Stallone wouldn't have been paid in the usual way or have signed official contracts, so they may have looked a little distasteful on paper. So instead, he was allegedly showered with gifts, including jewelry valued at $24,000, a car valued at $97,000, and a saddlebred horse valued at $80,000. Holy sh! I feel like, no, 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 I've never taken any money from Raid Shadow Legends. Yeah, 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 no, uh, that Ferrari was a gift from Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> ah! So you got paid by Raid, yes. I mean, no, I didn't, this is all a fictional story. Raid Shadow Legends haven't bought me a car. But if they did, I would have been paid by Raid Shadow Legends. How dare you! Philip Morris allegedly preferred to target superheroes such as Superman and Supergirl. Although the character of Lois Lane was never actually depicted as a smoker in the original comics, she was a rampant Marlboro chain smoker in the first two Superman movies. In fact, Superman 2 features no less than 20 significant exposures of the Marlboro logo on billboards and delivery trucks, leading one critic at the time to suggest that the Marlboro Man gets more screen time than Superman. That is so intense and can't believe that is allowed. Other productions alleged to have been showered in gifts from the tobacco industry in returns for dubious product placement, including Beverly Hills Cop 3 License to Kill, the Muppet movie, in which thankfully the human characters are seen smoking rather than Kermit the Frog or Fo Fozzie Bear, and Grease. Yes, it would be a very different story if <laughs> like, the Muppets were smoking. Uh.
The latter film is possibly the worst offender of all time when it comes to glamorizing smoking and delivering frankly terrible life lessons. I don't think I've ever seen Grease. Have I seen Grease? Ah, it feels familiar. I f hate musicals. Smart and studious non-smoking girl falls in love with Smoker Boy who acts a bit like a knob. Boy shuns girl to look cool in front of his equally knobbish mates. Girl takes up smoking and changes everything about herself to finally win the heart of the knobbish boy who becomes a bit of a knob herself in the process. A lesson for us all to bond here, I think. Grease is riddled with cancer. Such a piece of <laughs> One, it's also called Grease. What the f who calls the movie Grease? It's just an unpleasant word. It just reminds me of a dirty oven. Well, excuse me, princess. One minor problem with the product placement approach stemmed from the lack of any written agreements or contract, which meant that the tobacco companies were often disappointed with the outcome. Oh, boo-hoo. If you'd wanted it put on paper, then you would have done that, wouldn't you? It'd be like if some company was like, Simon, we'd really like you to promote Raid Shadow Legends. We've purchased you a Ferrari. Uh, there's obviously no contract, so uh, you can just mention how you wish. And I, uh, and then I mentioned in the video, ah, you can download Raid Shadow Legends if you want. They bought me a Ferrari. Ah! And then Raid were like, what the f*** whistler? And I'd be like, show me the contract, bitch. <laughs> and they'd be like, we're taking back the Ferrari. But like, oh, I liked it. Actually, I think I could keep it because like, they bought it for me. Just be like, I was a gift, motherfucker. I really hope Red, Red Shadow Legends write to me now. Be like, yeah. If that's what it takes, whistle boy. Bum, 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 bum. lost where I was. Ha! Well, what a surprise! For example, Cool may have allegedly given over $20,000 worth of gifts to the makers of the Renegade Bond film Never Say Never Again, including over $7,000 worth of jewelry for Sean Connery. But that, that, that doesn't seem a lot of jewelry for Sean Connery. I mean, he's gonna get paid millions of dollars. Oh, this was back in the day though, wasn't it? But he's getting paid millions of dollars. He's like, yeah, thanks. That's a nice chain. <laughs> what jewel? What? $7,000? What sort of $7,000 jewelry does a man wear outside of a watch? I don't even know. There's no jewel. I don't think I'd wear... A wedding ring, but it's just made of gold. Like I got, a, I have a, my, I have a wedding ring made of gold. I'm not sure I could put some diamonds in it, but that's what women do. What other jewelry would I possibly be wearing? Uh, but the company was said to be a bit miffed when the final cut showed a packet of super cool lights on screen for a second, and you couldn't even properly make out the label. Boo. Hey. Tobacco product placement in films, TV and video games would later be completely outlawed as part of the 1998 Master Settlement Agreement, the same agreement that banned the use of cartoon characters and placed tighter restrictions on advertising, sponsorship and lobbying. It would see America's four largest tobacco companies pay out a record-breaking settlement of $206 billion to 46 states to be spent on medical costs and smoking. Holy sh**! And I know that's not a typo, because I, I know there was a settlement in the billions. $206 billion is absolutely wild. That is like Jeff Bezos' net worth in fines. <laughs> Intriguingly though, the number of times we've seen cigarettes depicted on the silver screen has skyrocketed by over 120% in the last decade. I can believe it. And it's like, yeah, 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 we banned it and now it's more prevalent than ever. Tobacco wins again. For sake. Uh, moving back to the real world, the tobacco industry has spent the best part of 70 years denying the weight of medical evidence against their products until they're blue in the face. The Philip Morrison Company claimed in 1976 that none of the things which have been found in tobacco smoke are, con are at concentrations which could be considered harmful. Anything can be considered harmful. Apple sauce is harmful if you get too much of it. Oh my god, you're saying words, but you're meaning nothing. Uh, it's like PR. The industry also fought hard against the idea that cigarettes might be addictive in any way, even though researchers began to suspect this in 1971. And the National Institute of Drug Abuse confirmed that nicotine was an addictive drug in 1982. It possibly didn't help matters that the FDA waited until 1994 before they officially recognized as nicotine, nicotine as a drug that <laughs> produced dependency. FDA, how about you pull the finger out? But Philip Morris wasn't buying into any of that nonsense, FDA. What do they know? Other than being, I assume, filled with scientists. <laughs> and uh, people who are generally impartial, but I, it's also America, so I assume there's some lobbying. And by lobbying, I mean bribes, allegedly. Just assume any future business, any future brain blaze, when I say this, lobbying, I mean bribes. Allegedly. Maybe this will refresh your memory. I don't know. It's still kind of hazy. How about this? Yeah, I remember him. I used to see him around. Why do you want to know? I can't tell you that. Well, maybe this will help. I really don't think I should. But Philip Morris wasn't buying into any of that nonsense. During a sworn courtroom testimony in 1997, the president of the company, James J. Morgan, answered a question on whether he believed cigarettes were addictive. He replied, pharmacologically, 
Pharmacologically, my answer is no. If they are behaviorally addictive or habit-forming, they are much like caffeine, or in my case, gummy bears. I love gummy bears, I want gummy bears, and I like gummy bears, and I eat gummy bears, and I don't like it when I don't eat my gummy bears, but I'm certainly not addicted to them. Mate, it sounds like you're addicted to gummy bears, doesn't it? Also, you can absolutely be addicted to caffeine. What the f are you talking about? It's just less harmful. Than, uh, I mean, nicotine and caffeine. I don't know which one's more harmful. I don't think I don't think nicotine by itself is a particularly harmful drug, right? But also, the way you get it typically is destroying your body. Whereas with caffeine, coffee, like maybe makes you a bit too much. Maybe it makes you a bit jittery. But wait, well, no, that's the actual caffeine, isn't it? But it's not coffee itself. Decaf coffee is not destroying your body, is it? Smoking lobby, industry, whatever. Considering the public outpouring of verbal diarrhea, it sounds like James may have gone slightly overboard with the Haribo sugar-free variety. The next stage of the maniac deep the next stage of the ma- The next stage of manic denial involved the discovery in the 1980s that passive smoking could also lead to lung cancer, heart disease, childhood respiratory disease, and cot death. Can you imagine being the tobacco company and like, oh my god, okay, guys, we finally accept it. Our product kills people. For sake yes we know we know and they're like guess what bitches it also kills people who are around people smoking the product oh, for sake Philip Morris sought to, sought to reassure any concerns over this with a series of print advertisements in 1987 in which a smoker made a lofty request of the reader. Please don't tell me my cigarette smoke is harmful to you. There's just no convincing proof that it is. Still, the truth nearly always comes out in the wash. And, the, and in 2006, the US District Court for the District of Columbia found four of the country's biggest tobacco companies to be guilty of lying to the public. Shocking. Uh, marketing to children and violating civil racketeering laws. I don't even know what racketeering is, but it sounds bad. Their punishment was to put, spend pots of money on TV commercials and full-page ads in which they issued corrective statements to atone for their dark past. This is not a million miles away from those shamed dogs you see on social media wearing signs around their neck, which make a guilty confession along the lines of, I puked on the duvet and tried to cover it up with a pillow. I've never seen this on social media. As someone who literally, d I, I, YouTube's not exactly social media. People are, oh, Simon, social media influencer. It's like, no, I'm not. But uh, I also have never seen this. I don't really, I do Twitter, at Simon Whistler. I'm not very good at it. I do nothing else. And I don't care to. I think it's all a giant waste of time. And to be honest, I think it turned into a bit of a pointless sh the idea was to issue a strongly worded statement such as we falsely marketed low tar and light cigarettes as, harm as less harmful than regular cigarettes to keep people from smoking and sustain our profits. Okay, it's very dry and succinct and factually accurate. But after 11 more years of legal wrangling over the precise wording, their admission, admission statement seemed a little diluted when they finally happened in 1997. Oh my god, it took them that long? When was the... T oh, okay. No, it was 11 years! It was 2006, 2007! Ah! It took them 11 years to, to, to argue over that. Can you imagine me and the lawyer doing that for 11 years and just make an absolute bank? I'm rich, bitch. Probably the boldest one of all read, cigarette companies intentionally designed cigarettes with enough nicotine to create and sustain addiction. It always sounds positive, doesn't it? Be like, sweet nicotine. But the overall effect was quite weird and stilted. This was partly because each settlement kicked off with the words, A federal court has ordered Al Tria, RJ Reynolds Tobacco, Laura Lard, and Philip Morris USA to make this statement about the health effects of smoking. Oh my god. And also partly because the narration on the TV spots was a weird computer-generated female voice, totally lacking in any emotion or soul or sincerity. A federal court has ordered... <laughs> Stephen Hawking. <laughs> ah, okay, they got Stephen Hawking to do it. They should have done that. He'd never do that. I don't know. They, he's just the automatic computer voice they think of, other than ETA. A federal court has ordered Altria, R.J. Reynolds Tobacco, Laura Lard, and Philip Morris USA to make this statement about the health effects of smoking. What the hell is even that? But here's a final chilling conclusion. It's been alleged, although naturally denied by the tobacco companies, that the industry has been taking giant steps towards inventing a genuinely safer cigarette from as early as the 1960s. For example, Brown and Williamson was granted the patent for an aerial cigarette in 1966, which would gently heat the tobacco instead of burning it, a concept notably sim similar to the ICOS electronic device which PMI, Philip Morris International, are now proudly peddling over 50 years down the line. Yeah, it's so popular, I see it everywhere. The New York Times claims that leaked internal documents have revealed how the aerial product project, along with many other efforts from rival tobacco companies, were shelved over concerns that it might affect publish perce public perception of regular cigarettes. So they just grimly plowed on with selling the toxic versions of their products for another five cancerous decades. Great job. 
This might be the dirtiest trick that the tobacco industry ever pulled. Holy sh**, tobacco industry. Am I right, everybody? And Philip. Philip, thank you for being here today. You've been a glorious addition. Peter will be back next time. Get the f out. This has been an episode of Brain Blaze brought to you by Squarespace. Thank you so much for watching. This was a long one, right? It feels long. Also, if you'd like to purchase some merch, you can get uh, The Boy with the Blaze. Yes, that's me. It's weird. I wear a t-shirt with my own face on it. Honestly, don't wear the ones with my face on it in public. It's too weird. PurchTheMerch.co is where you go. And thank you for watching. What are we talking about? Ah, oh, yes, cancer.